Welcome to Let's Face the Facts, the rewatch podcast for the classic sitcom, The Facts of Life. Join us each week as we synopsize, analyze, criticize, and ultimately idolize the show. And now, here's your host of Let's Face the Facts, the wonderful David Almeida! Thank you, Matthew Arter. Welcome back. It's another week, another show. Thank you for downloading and pressing play. This week, Matthew and I are watching Season 7, Episode 2, Into the Frying Pan, which has an original air date of September 21st of 1985. We have more TV research this week as a continuation of the season premiere from last week, so let's jump on in. Let's face the facts. Well, good morning, Matthew. Oh my God, David. I'm going to try not to be nasal, and I'm going to try to have interesting and funny things to say. Uh, Why start now? You know, no, I don't know. It's very early. <laughs> Dear <laughs> listeners, it is like I don't what time I've not I haven't seen the clock this early in so long. <laughs> it is eleven o'clock in the morning. Oh God. <laughs> well, oh. season seven, episode two is upon us. It, and it I, what, what, um, what, what, okay. You're you already having fields that need to be felted. Well, what, what's your initial thoughts? I felt like, I felt like I was you watching this, David. Like I almost hated every single line in this episode. Oh my God. I, I didn't hate this. Loved it. I you didn't loved hate it. it. <laughs> All right. I don't, I don't know. what. And again, I, it was like 8 a.m. when I was watching this, David. I'm, I'm sorry. Like, I, I, Made you it get out of bed before noon. <laughs> it, was, it was 10 a.m. when I watched this. So I was already a little cranky. But <laughs> I just have so many. There's just like, who's writing this now? Like, uh huh. And it's the same writers. That's the funny thing is that uh, talking about it. Well, this is this is our segue right here. Talking about season seven, episode two, Into the Frying Pan. Original air date, September 21st of 85. Directed by John Boab, as usual, and written by Deidre Fay and Stuart Wolpert. They've written a bunch of shows already and are executive producers and will continue to write. So it's not like there there's new blood going on here. Did they? Is this the season? I want to find out if this is the season they were hooked on crack or cocaine. <laughs> or something. You know what I mean? Like, were they going through a divorce? Like, what was what was um, keeping their attention away from their show bible <laughs> and everything about these characters? But well, they all we, look great. Thank you, Diana Eden. They, they do. Amazing. <laughs> God, the costuming, <laughs> brava. Um, well, remember, show bible was in Edna's edibles and it burned up in the fire. So. It's gone. Right. It's uh, gone. As were Andy's parents. I still, I listened to last week's episode and I'm like, I, I really think I'm right. I really think Andy's parents should have died in the fire, but uh, you know. Hey. I was listening to that and thinking more. What if Andy's parents were the government employees, the government narcs that were coming after Mrs. Garrett? That forced her into the witness protection program after she ratted out her dealers. Yeah. <gasps> Ooh. <laughs> Uh, this is way better than anything we're going to see over the next three years of shows, Matthew. <laughs> uh, it's funny because as I'm going through my notes, I realized this is technically part two of the season premiere. They treat it like that because we do get a recap at the beginning of this. There, was there a recap in the Daily Motion? There was not. Oh, then that's one of the things that was eliminated for the syndicated uh, version is that there is a recap where they review what happened uh, and it says like in part one and i'm like interesting because it's it, it's not called out of the fire part one out of the fire part two these are two shows with two different titles they were originally aired on two different weeks um but but i mean they are i mean with the titles does link them together out of the fire into the frying pan mm -hmm. a so. marvelous play on words ladies and gentlemen <laughs> Uh, yeah, which reminded me, I was watching Dear Apple the other day, and I was like, How did nobody mention that that was? Did you mention that that was a play on Dear Abby? 
Oh, is that what that was? <laughs> I have a feeling. Oh, well, that's pretty awful. I mean, <laughs> is that no, no. Yeah, we didn't we didn't hit that when we were talking Apple because it's an Apple. Uh, Apple is a brand of computer, which it was not that she was working on. Right. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh. Anyway, since this is part two of the season premiere, I have all my TV research that I did. Oh, I've been looking forward to this. And I purposely, it's like I, I've purposely avoided the, the finale, David, because I didn't do any research or any looking. So I can be as surprised as you are with my research for episode one. Are you are you touching your breasticles? I'm very excited to hear about the TV of 1985, David. <laughs> <laughs> So leave us turn back the clock, Matthew. We have just completed season six of The Facts of Life. The season was 1984 to 1985. Uh, here's an interesting thing. There is conflicting information on the internet. I, I, I know it's I don't hard to believe. I don't the internet anymore, David. Between Thriller and Cabbage Patch Kids. <laughs> and even <laughs> Atari last time. I left that out, I think. Atari, because... It was like Atari's big. And I was like, Atari, we talked about that on episode one. Yeah. Atari <laughs> was around in like 81, like shortly oh. after Pac-Man was in the, the anyway. Um, but here's the deal. By some accounts, the facts of life was number 30. And so therefore it did make the top 30. But if you look at the list on Wikipedia, it is not there. The numbers are a little bit off. And in the TV guide articles that our, our Tutti Fruity listener, Jim S has been sending and I've been sharing on the blog, uh, that has what TV guide published right after the season. And it's like, okay, well, those numbers technically shouldn't be changing over time. It's not like there's ballots that got lost or was sitting in someone's trunk. But uh, but I'm just saying is that you'll notice that as those are being posted on the website, those don't agree with the Facts of Life Wikipedia page, which doesn't agree with the Nielsen page in Wikipedia. But anyhow. Um, are you telling me that something on Wikipedia is wrong? <laughs> It, it is possible. It is possible. I thought you go to Wikipedia to get the best answers for everything because anybody can write on it, can't they? So <laughs> only smart people share information, right? I feel like right? that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the deal: the facts of life. Their best season was still season three, which uh, had them at number twenty-four. That is the best they ever did. Uh, but it still consistently clocks in the 30s the worst it would ever be in its final season is 38 and of course we're ignoring season one where it was 74 it's like season one just doesn't exist really right. but yeah 38 i mean we know they wanted more seasons and it was the girls who said no let's not we're done but you understand why the network wanted to keep it going it was still in that new Saturday lineup where we've just started that. Uh, but anyway, let's, for the sake of, we just want to put it in the top 30 for that year. Let's say it was number 30. Um, that was its final year in the 9 PM Wednesday night time slot after your favorite show, highway to heaven. Oh, Jesus! <laughs> if you could have just had him in Highway to Heaven with the bucket lunch. You would have gotten the best of Michael Landon. Uh, they would have had to have Melissa Sue Gilbert like show up looking like she's four in one episode and then 38 in the next episode <laughs> to really get the Little House on the yeah. Prairie vibe. Yeah, it was on TV for like, what did we say? 10 or 11, maybe 12 years total. It's like, how did she age 30 years in 12? <laughs> the same way I've aged 30 years in the past five, David, the same way. You and me both, good Lord. Hard living. <laughs> uh, now, the Wednesday night time slot that the Facts of Life is abandoning will be replaced with uh, Give Me a Break. And Give Me a Break will be followed by uh, a show that I don't really remember. It's called You Again. It was two half seasons, so two 13-episode seasons. It starred Jack Klugman and a very young yeah. John Stamos. Yeah, Jack Klugman, and it was his son, wasn't it? Jack yeah. John Stamos played his estranged son. And it was basically um, what that fucking um, 
Tom Hanks and um, Jackie Gleason movie. Nothing in common. Yeah, it was basically that. Yeah, that sounds right. That sounds like what it was. But yeah, it ran two half seasons. And I'm like, God, I don't remember that show at all. But um, let's track the Nielsen's overall. You know, I like to do the uh, Battle of the Network Stars. Mm. So, Matthew, we know that NBC's ratings and shows were in the shitter when we started Facts of Life in 1979. Uh, well, I always like to compare the Nielsen's to the Emmys. Oh, who doesn't? Yes, like, who doesn't? <laughs> yeah. I love that this is what you do for fun. And it's like, oh, part of me wants to say this is why you're single. Yeah. And the other part makes me want to say this is kind of why I love you. <laughs> oh. Go ahead. Looking at the top 30 in the Nielsen's, CBS is still the front runner. CBS has 13, but... Before, it was always neck and neck with ABC, and NBC was always trailing far behind. NBC has pulled into second place with 11 shows in the top 30, and ABC has only six. Well, NBC had started the Cosby show, right? Mm -hmm. As well so as Family Ties was building its audience. The A-Team was already there. I think it was like number four the previous season. A-Team is a little bit lower now. I think it's number six for that. But uh, yeah, this is all on Wikipedia. I'll post the links on the website. But comparing it to the Emmys, <laughs> the number of nominations, we're talking major nominations. I think it might not include technical awards, but NBC has 79 nominations. CBS has 39. That is half. And ABC has 13 <laughs> it's like ABC. Well, we know who the critical darlings are, but it's because the Cosby show got 13 nominations. Saint Elsewhere got 10 of them. The Golden Girls got nine. Cheers got eight. And uh, it's just NBC was building their empire. And this season now, the Cosby show is really the thing that is just now going to make the whole must-see TV thing explode. So... Um, and last year, I think NBC was high up, too, because they had St. Elsewhere. They had Hill Street Blues. NBC was the Emmy front runner, I believe, last year. I could look back in my notes, but to do that would mean to make an effort. And lastly, Matthew, before we move on, you know, I always like to look at the shows that go away and the shows yeah. that begin. So the new series now going forward, starting here with season seven of The Facts of Life, it is now on Saturday nights, and it is in the company of new shows on ABC, like The Colbys, oh. spinoff of Dynasty, Growing Pains. Mm. That's Alan Thicke's show, right? Yep. And yeah. And Kirk Cameron. And Kirk Cameron. MacGyver. Okay. Perfect Strangers. That okay. ran a while. And Spencer for Hire. <laughs> that is honorable mention because you know spencer for hire was filmed in boston so it was a thing i went to high school with a girl who was on that show like playing some kid having the shit beat out of her in a van or something but anyway so now not returning to abc foul ups bleeps and blunders oh just rolls off the tongue every time <laughs> I say it. and we talked about that before that's the steve lawrence and Don Rickles show where they fucking just would refilm Don Rickles shit without his knowing you had said. Uh, also leaving us TJ Hooker Shatner uh, that, series. That means we're losing Shatner and his wig. <laughs> oh my God. Have you, why have you seen TJ Hooker? Never. Oh, the rug. It's <laughs> pretty bad where it might as well be carpet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The hair in the eighties, it could have it, some of the styles were bad and the rugs like the Burt Reynolds and yeah, they're, they're pretty awful. Uh, and lastly, leaving ABC three's a crowd. Gee, that didn't run very long. Wonder why? Oh, it was awful. CBS added the equalizer. That was a show that was popular and ran. I never watched it. Mm -mm. 
And uh, you, re- you realize th- why I'm starting to drift away from this. You're going to hear me more and more saying, I never watched this, never watch this. This is just when I was starting to get into drama club in high school and theater was taking over my life. And it's like, oh, you can do other things outside of the house other than sit in front of the TV and watch it 12 hours a day. That's interesting that you're going to be fading away from it because this is where I was, you know, just starting to walk and um, doing, you know, pre-K. So I think. Um, so you were getting the, the braces off of your legs that you wore till you were 30. How do you? And you were what the K as in the, the drug the kids were doing in the 90s. You were. I doing... was from Indiana and I got away with that telling people that it was polio, David. <laughs> So if you're going to make fun of that, you're now making fun of everyone who has suffered from polio. Oh, dear. Um, Now, not returning to CBS after MASH. (laughs) Just like Three's a Crowd. It's those sequel series where it's like, nope, Three's a Crowd. Nope. Joey after Friends. Nope. Frasier. Well, okay, we'll give you 11 years. Fine. Uh, Alice. Alice had its finale that spring. Mm. Um, Charles in Charge was canceled by CBS, but of course moved into syndication and would live a long life after that. Uh, the Lucy Arnaz show, <laughs> speaking of Frasier, <laughs> we mentioned that last time. Um, but two other big series that uh, no longer on TV, The Dukes of Hazard mm. and The Jeffersons. Oh, Do, you realize... I didn't, I, there's a part of me that was like, oh, it didn't realize it ran that long. And then there's another part of me that's like, oh, it ended in 85. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's late. Cause I mean, when you think of, they first appeared on All in the Family in like what, 71? Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, It's like, it's crazy to think how long those characters existed. Similar to Frasier on Cheers, where it's like, that's a 20 year span. He did nine years on Cheers. Yeah. And then 11 on Frasier, which is in fucking sane. Uh, and now on to our beloved NBC. New series, 227. No place like home. <laughs> family around you, you're never alone. Oh, I love 227. I did too. I love it. Unwatchable now, but it is. Yep. It is. Yeah. Beginning career of a young Regina King, future Academy Award winner. Mm-hmm. And and director, she was nominated for um the is it called One Night in Miami? Sure, yeah, she directed that movie that was up for Best Picture, and actually, some people thought it was uh, the favorite to win, but instead, the Francis McDormand depressing uh, living on the road. What's it called? Nomadland. Yeah, lovely movie, lovely movie. I really enjoyed it. I appreciate it. I never need to sit through it again. Never. And Francis, we get it. <laughs> but run a fucking brush through your hair. Have some <laughs> respect for the fucking ceremony. Like, I'm all for fuck the establishment. I'm all for that. But if you, if you d- d- don't show up, if you're that annoyed that you have to be there to fucking be handed your fucking Academy Award. If you're that annoyed, don't show up. If you can't be bothered, if you think it's stupid, don't fucking show up. But if you are going to show up, put some fucking effort in. <laughs> Throw some goddamn lip color on. You're at the goddamn Oscars. Get out of that potato sack and run a fucking brush through your hair, Francis. Francis. This has been Red Carpet Corner with Matthew Arder. <laughs> oh. Yeah. What, didn't she win a Tony a few years ago and she was wearing like a denim jean jacket? And like was... she just got off the fucking subway. <laughs> like she's like she's on the subway going on the L train going, oh fuck, I gotta I gotta go to the Tony's tonight. Where I'm gonna wear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God bless her. I'm with you. I, I totally get it. It's like that. No, why should she have to? Why is that a, a demanded and required, particularly of women, versus men can just put on a suit from their closet and look perfectly fine. But yeah, you're kind of like there's suit. Then put on a suit. I'm not asking her to put on a fucking ball gown. I'm just asking her to put a fucking brush through her hair. (laughs) I was going to say there is probably some some mid level, some mid range where you could you could go to, you know, Burdines or Macy's and say, 
yeah, could I could I get a hundred dollar dress and you Remember know. when it went fucking crazy that Sharon Stone wore a Gap sweater to the Oscars? Remember oh that? God, that's They're like, right. who are you wearing? And she's like, got it at Gap. Mm-hmm. And yeah. she still looked like she could be outside of her house. <laughs> <laughs> Francis. <laughs> uh, anyway, so what were we talking about? We were talking about uh, shows two, that are two, new. Seven. We were talking about 227. Where do we get Francis McDormand? Oh, the Oscars. Oh, Regina King. Okay, back to 227. <laughs> and... I'm sorry. <laughs> I love it. Um, you Again, that's that new show we were talking about <laughs> with uh, the wonderful Jack Klugman and John Stamos and a little show called The Golden Girls. Mm. Yeah. And then not returning from NBC, from the 1984-85 season, different strokes because it is moving to ABC. NBC did cancel it, but ABC took it over for one season. And it is very different when you look at those later different strokes. Is, is, is. Wow. A- ABC was like, oh, so, oh, this is why you canceled that. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, partners in crime, not coming back. Oh, the wonderful... Um... Linda, Linda Carter and, and Lonnie Anderson. Also not returning from NBC from the 84, 85 season V that's the series about the aliens with Brian Dennehy and double trouble a show we have referenced many times that I have literally never watched. I just think it's the best fucking title for a show. All right. And I think that wraps up all the stuff I have for our uh, television deep dive that we do at the beginning of every season, Matthew. And again, like you said last week, if people are looking for hardcore facts, this is not the place for them. Mm -mm. (laughs) Absolutely not. No, we will give you the links to Wikipedia. That's where you find the facts. Of life. Come on. Come on. Come on. So, uh, Matthew... I guess as the regular uh, co-host of this show now, it is now falling upon you to every week give the one to two sentence synopsis as one might see in TV Guide by the look on your face. You did not prepare for this, which is why I'm thrilled to say, Matthew, synopsize, go. The girls meet their new neighbor when his newspaper is delivered to their house by mistake. That's it. Wow. I, I think nailed it. That's Nailed the only it right thing there. That happens in this episode. I don't know about you, David. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, so let's start talking about the the littler stuff that happens here. Um, our theme song, a little bit different from last week. We still have the Edna's Edibles title card, so we haven't seen the finished over our heads yet. They're holding that back, and Clooney has the credit before Joe, before Nancy McKeon, not Mackenzie Aston as Andy. So we do not have Andy in this show. And it's like, he's not in the show. Doesn't get a fucking credit. You're out of here, kid. So, yeah. And this is George Clooney's first episode of the Facts of Life. He will be on it for 17 episodes throughout this and next season. He is 24 years old. Son and of a bitch. How fuckable is he? Jesus. He's just. I mean. Beautiful. And but but also there's a goofy charm about him. I think that's what the network saw. And that's why they were constantly trying to find something for him that was a good fit. Because he's just so affable. You just fucking love him the instant he walks on the screen. And that's why he's George Clooney. And that's why 45 years later, we're talking about George Clooney. And Mm -hmm. we would still lick the sweat off of his balls. (laughs) Uh, Academy Award winner, George Clooney, I will add. Indeed. Do you know how many Oscars he has? (laughs) No. Did you know he had any Oscars? No, I didn't know he had any. (laughs) Did you not know? Oh, I'm not a movie person, David. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll go with that. I'm mad at Francis McDormand for God's sake. (laughs) He has been nominated eight times in some capacities as actor, some as director, some as producer. And he has won 
two. In 2006, he won Best Supporting Actor for the wonderful screwball comedy, (laughs) Syriana. (laughs) But the uh, probably bigger, higher profile film that he won as a producer was in 2013, Argo. Okay. That's the one that Ben Affleck directed. And I think he co-adapted the screenplay. So Ben Affleck got a lot of attention for it because it was uh, his, wasn't his directorial debut, but it was um, impressive. And he was nominated, but he didn't win Best Director. But then Argo went on and won Best Picture. So uh, as one of the producers, Ben Affleck and Clooney, they go home with Oscars when you win Best Picture. The producers win those. So are we ready to get into a uh, scene by scene, line by line, <laughs> punctuation by punctuation, Matthew? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Well, the very beginning of the episode, the shot is of the walls. We pan across these walls down the stairway and we start to see the upper balcony. We explore the new set that is the new living room in which they live. Uh, There are two different tones of cream on the crown molding and on the wood and the inlaid wood inset. Uh, The banister is still wood, but the spokes or the, what are they called? Along the stairway, those are all uh, cream colored now. Uh, There's a green wall leading off to Mrs. Garrett's bedroom. Uh, The main color is this bluish lavender and uh, some other walls have wallpaper details. The, The big deal is that it's not all wood and brick on the fireplace. That was kind of the dominant color theme that we had before. Now it is all about the 80s soft, bright colors that dominated. Honestly, I love it. It's of its time, but I really, I really do kind of like it. So they're all assessing the new look. All the girls and Mrs. Garrett are there. They're talking about the new look and what they love. And finally, when we pull down and give a full establishing shot of all of them standing in the room, ain't no goddamn furniture. No, a perfectly finished house with no furniture. With no furniture. No talk of where they're sleeping or if the bedroom has been part of this renovation. Uh, One, I guess, can assume, but... They never get, they never acquire furniture. Anytime they're in the house, this entire episode, they're standing or maybe sitting on the hearth in front of the fireplace. Uh, It's like, okay, Um, fine. So they are now talking about the fact that they have to renovate the store. Yeah, isn't our new home renovation lovely? We have a pretty place to live with no furniture. That was money well spent. So how about that store that would actually generate some income? Maybe we ought to focus our attention on that now, don't you think? Or how did we hire a contractor that can do houses, but was like, oh, I don't do stores. (laughs) Exactly. Ooh, the the windows are so big. I just, ooh, I can't, you know, wow. What contract? Why would they have just their, their, their house? That was my big confusion. Yeah. Who who redid the house? was like, you want us to do that? No, no. Do not touch the burnt down store part of the house. (laughs) <laughs> and, and George Cooney walks in when he does come in later in the scene in the show actually he does say hey I uh, just let myself in you know you've got a hole in the front of your building and they're like yeah we had a fire we know that because Joe walked through the window the hole so it's like have you not even boarded up your goddamn windows but you know glad the crown moldings the perfect shade of cream yeah uh <laughs> Glad but you're totally can, right. You know, can walk right in, apparently. <clears throat> but you're right in terms of, well, we need to start interviewing contractor. Who did this room? <laughs> <laughs> what the deal? Uh, anyway, so uh, then we get to uh, the, the, the scene literally ends with, we need to start interviewing contractors. And then we go back out to the burnt up shop And we get this montage of four different potential contractors, sort of quick clips, as it were, uh, of different uh, characters coming through. And, you know, when it comes to wacky characters on a sitcom, ain't nothing as wacky as a contractor. We have 
what I call belly guy, Zeke, the guy with his shirt a little too high up and his belly hanging out. You know, they wanted that to be the ass crack showing through the pants that are riding low, but they couldn't get that cleared with standards and practices. No, oh, they were on before nine o'clock. Yeah, they're on the 830. Exactly. The family hour. Um so this actor who plays Zeke, he will be back, the belly guy. This actor is Dave Shelley. And actually, as I list off the actors, all four of them, they all have those great uh, careers with a smattering of one-off appearances here and there and some series, but no big thing. There's no one of them that's like, and he would go on to do 5,000 episodes of CSI or whatever. They're all just working character actors. And none of these actors ever appear on a future episode of Facts of Life. This is the only time we see them on the show. You know, I always like to check that for any return guests. Zeke, he quotes them (laughs) $30,000. And he needs it now, but can't start until for six months. Yeah. That's that's what you get now during the pandemic when you want to change out a window or put in a storm door. It, it'll be 30 grand. I need the money now and I can't start for six months if I show the fuck up. Yeah. But uh, did you look up how much money that is, Matthew? I did not. $30,000 in 2021 dollars is 74,293. Jesus. Yeah, but that doesn't seem excessive to me. Looking at that store, if you put me in that store today and said, how much do you think it's going to be to bring this place back? I I would be like, I don't think it could be done for under a hundred grand personally, but you know, so the second uh, contractor they interview is the stereotypical gay guy. His name is Armand and he's having these visions of colors and the walls need to breathe. And he's using his arms and gesturing and lisping. And it's very clear what they're going for here. Uh, This actor's name is Richard Brestoff, B-R-E-S-T-O-F-F. I do like that he's dressed um, exactly like Joe. (laughs) I I think that's the same jacket that she wore last week. It looked very similar. Yeah. You know, Diana Eden, you you had a budget, so you got to recycle where you can. Uh, So then the third one is a woman. This, uh, for those who listened to my interview with Jennifer Krista Palmer a couple of weeks ago, if this were filmed today, this is the role JCP would play, where she just walks in and says $45,000. And Mrs. Garrett's like, uh, and she's like, it's because I'm a woman, isn't it? You think just because I wear a skirt, I can't pour concrete. And she is this dry as paint and just, but it's like, it's like uh, you're intimidated by my femininity (laughs) type of a character. It's very funny. The actress is uh, Laura Esterman. And uh, lastly, we have the money guy, I call him, where he walks in and she says, hello, my name is, and he goes, 50 grand. Just straight up, just one look. It doesn't even have a time to get a name. Uh, But yeah, so the prices keep going up as we go on here. So $50,000 in 2021 dollars is $123,822. And I, I don't doubt that a renovation like that could cost that. These are not outrageous other than in sitcom land, That's a high number and we don't have a lot of money. I only have a millionaire living under my roof who could write a fucking check. But okay, we're not going to go there. We talked about that last week. Blair. I have a question about contractors, David, and I've never dealt with one. Okay, go right ahead. They're all giving her an estimate, having seen no plans. Wouldn't a contractor be like, what do you want this to look like mm-hmm. <laughs> before they give an estimate? And they don't even really know what the store is going to be yet. I mean, they know. So I just mm, I have questions about how the contractors came up with these plans when they didn't even know what they were going to build. You're, you're totally right in terms of it's one thing to be like, I want to add a bedroom to my house. Well, a bedroom, you know, is going to be walls, has to have a closet, has to have a window, that's code. And, you know, you need to extend the roof to be over the new wing of the house. There's pretty 
basic understandings there, but you're totally right. It has to be, okay, so this was Edna's edibles before. Do you want all the wood there? Or are we just going to do drywall? Because probably the drywall is going to be cheaper. Um, I, I'm with you there. There's... <laughs> So that was my first issue with this thriving. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, you're totally right. So we come out of this montage back to the house where they're standing around because they can't sit and, uh, and, and apparently can't even get a card table and some folding chairs. Where do they eat? Did the kitchen get renovated? Is the kitchen up and running? Oh, do wait they... till you see the kitchen, David. Wait till wait, you see the kitchen. Do they still have a kitchen? It's not a bakery anymore. We don't need a bakery because there's a bakery painted on the backdrop behind the store. We still see that fugly backdrop from last week that we were we were dissing. But oy. anyway, so as they're looking around and trying to figure out who they want to use their contractor, in comes this guy named George Burnett, played by an actor named George Clooney, whom we have previously drooled about. He and God, he just gets better with age. He ugh. and such a good actor. And maybe that's what the problem was. Maybe it's because he was so uh, goofy and likable. And they're like, oh, got to get this guy in a sitcom, in a sitcom. He's great. But actually, when you think of it, Clooney's career really started being built, built when he started doing drama, doing oh, ER oh. and. Yeah, and I can I can speak to this, David, because I can tell you um, how difficult it is in comedy when you are just drop dead gorgeous. You know, you need to you're not relatable to mm -hmm. to the everyday Joe. Um, so I think Hollywood saw me and George Clooney and were like, nobody's going to believe you as a comedian <laughs> because this is why I do a podcast because people can't see me. So they're not intimidated. Yeah. And I think George Clooney suffered through that as well. Yeah. Okay. Oh, totally. Yeah, absolutely. I think your looks have absolutely limited your career, Matthew, without question. I know. I mm -hmm. know. Uh, so. The reason for his arrival and walking through the front of the store, I mean, you could knock on the back door, which is the front door of this, what the fuck is it house that we've discussed so many times starting in season five. Um, he, uh, his paper was accidentally delivered there. And they're like, your paper? And he's like, yeah, a lot of postage, strange lettering. And they go over to the paper and we have a show Bible moment, Matthew. Oh, they go over and pick up this rolled up paper that has a lot of stamps on it. And in their pile of mail, Tootie looks at it and she says, oh, 918 High Street. And he goes, yeah, I'm 819. Easy mistake. So Edna's Edibles is 918 High Street. Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, in season five, episode 22, all by herself, you will recall that character actor Ernie Sabella brought in a big, beautiful male statue. And he goes, is this 320 Main Street? And they say, yeah. And he says, good, that's all I need to know. And he brings in the statue uh, because Jerry had ordered it. It was the final Cousin Jerry episode, you might recall. So we have previously established that Edna's Edibles is 320 Main Street. I thought you were gonna make a joke about Edna's Edibles being on High Street. Oh, fuck me. How did I forget that? Uh, all signs are pointing to the fact that Edna Garrett was the Northeastern drug queen pin. Yeah. Lived it on High Street, ran a shop called Edna's Edibles. This cements <laughs> the fact that, okay, this, thank you. I appreciate the, the <laughs> this proves everything that I have said. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, and this whole thing of, we can't afford this contractor for when I torch the place again and try to skip town like I unsuccessfully tried to do. <laughs> anyway, FYI, we, we have established a new address for Edna's Edibles. <sighs> okay, fine. Um, so the reason why George is there to collect this paper for some reason is... Uh, he lived for a couple of years in Kuwait. 
And so now we have license to do some Islamophobic jokes for the rest of the fucking show. I mean, when it comes to the Middle East, let's just let's punch them below the gut because comedy gold, comedy gold. None of the things that he said are accurate or appropriate. (laughs) It's just, this is why Americans think, oh, they, oh, you know, those Arabs, they wipe their butt with their left hand. Yeah. And it's like, oh God, for God's sake. It's it's pretty bad, all the things, but uh, I did make a little bit of a list here. Uh, He did live in Kuwait, apparently for two years because he worked for an American company installing hot tubs, uh, which is the whole thing of, yeah, it, Kuwait was in the news. It was part of our cultural discourse in the late 70s and early 80s because of the energy crisis, uh, the uh, fuel shortage, and the idea of the oil all being over in the Middle East and there being very, very rich oil tycoons living in that part of the world. So that's kind of the stereotype. But he talks about them having multiple wives. I don't know if that's true. Uh, They mention him going to a baseball game and it's like a baseball game in Kuwait. And he says, well, they play it with goats. Uh, At one point, Natalie makes a comment. Does he have any references? And Natalie says, well, call Ahmed and ask him if he did a good job. Yeah. And it's that's like, that's on par with, you know, calling all black men Leroy. Like that is so fucking offensive. Well, right off the uh, bat, Joe says, um, you know, uh, I hear they, they burn dung to keep warm. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty crazy. <laughs> How that's there it is. Islamophobic is the perfect word. I couldn't find it when I was typing it, but yeah, because Kuwait is a country in the northern edge of Eastern Arabia at the tip of the Arabian Gulf, bordering Iraq to the north and Saudi Arabia to the south. And as a country, they do speak Arabic. So just little factoids in case you don't know what and where Kuwait is. I I may have had to look that up myself to pinpoint exactly. I knew it was in the Middle East, but moving on. I know show tunes. So you we know where it was, but you know, they don't play goat ball. For yeah, <laughs> it's, it's true. It's so true. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, so George is back in town after this stint in Kuwait. Uh, his dad owns a hardware store, so he's handy. And Tootie's like, wait, wait, wait. So do, you're in the construction because you installed hot tubs. And uh, he's like, well, yeah. And they're like, We'll look out in the store. Tell us what you think it might take. Are you are you available that you would be able to fix a thing up? You know, because the guy who did our living room clearly pff, hack, fuck this up. We can't use him again. You know. <laughs> so when he leaves the room, the girls are all like, "So what do you think of that?" And Natalie, of course, horny Natalie. He's adorable, but they're all like, "This could be a thing." Well, we have to see what he says. Or the but. One of them is not charmed at all by this man. Who is that, Matthew? What a surprise. Joe doesn't trust this guy. Wow. I mean, he is kind of dressed slightly more masculine than she is. Uh, He does have the same mullet hair, too. They have the same fucking hair. I just feel like you, you know that there's a sense of you know, we only need one man around this house, and it's me. <laughs> but uh, at least he doesn't dress like the stand-up comic. He's He's got the jeans and the lumberjack shirt going on, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but while they're talking, like kind of back and forth thing, well, the, the Joe's like, I don't know. I don't trust this guy. And then Mrs. Garrett chimes in with, he's Fred Burnett's son, and he has a good reputation. Um, okay, where, where did that, did that just, where did this factoid come from? The cougar and Mrs. Garrett's coming out. She's like, we're hiring this dude, Joe. <laughs> but this is a, a writer. This is a rewrite thing where I'm like script wise. Well, why would she say that to them here now, as opposed to when he says, my dad owns a hardware store. 
and have her say, oh, are you Fred Burnett's son? And him say, yeah. And say, oh, your father speaks so highly of you. He says that you're a really fine workman or something. I mean, it just, there's no reason that couldn't have come out in conversation with him. And then in this conversation, then she could reiterate, no, his dad says he's really good at what he does. And I trust Fred because he I owns the hardware it. store. See, and I took it as he's Fred Burnett's son. He has a good reputation. Fred has a good reputation. Oh, oh, I see what you mean. So that's how I took that. Oh, maybe you're right with that. But still, why would she, if she knows this Fred Burnett, that she would call him by first name due to her knowledge of his hardware store, why wouldn't she say that to George's face? It's just a weird little, uh, little itty bitty little writing weird thing. Um, But With Joe's reticence, duly noted, she is basically outvoted, even though Mrs. Garrett says this has to be unanimous. We're all partners. Joe (sighs) begrudgingly says, "Okay, fine, you can hire him. And she does say what she does say before he goes, she goes before he goes to look. I don't know why I have this right now. She goes, and I like to extend that south wall. Oh, oh, yeah. You would? Well. (laughs) Mm-hmm. When did you decide not to do that? Because it's exactly the same as anyway. So. Yeah, no, you're right. And extend that's like your earlier comment. It's like, well, what are the plans? It's like, uh, yeah, he says I can do it for $15,000, which is really, really cheap. That's part of the reason why they're sold on him. But it's like, oh, good. That that includes the gilding all around the the, the gold leaf that we want on every surface. That includes uh, the... Uh, imported Italian limestone stairs. And uh, yeah, it's like, what, what is the scope of work is the, I think, term that they might use. So then we move on to the next scene in the store while George is working, Natalie and Tootie are kind of sort of helping, but also kind of sort of not. And then, um, but, and that was my thing. Are they doing this themselves? That's just it. If it had been, at one point, Natalie says, hey, why am I working here? And he says, that's why I'm so cheap. It, it would have been actually kind of nice if he came out, I can do it for 15000 and have them say, what, that, are you sure? That's crazy cheap. And he's like, well, I, I can't do it alone. You all are going to help, right? And then have him be like, oh, well, yeah, that kind of makes sense type yeah. of deal. That would be fine. Yeah. So he's telling them stories about Kuwait, about a girl with a veil, and how he got deported because he pulled the veil aside to take a peek at her. Uh, thank you. Do they Again, wear burkas? Do they wear burkas in Kuwait? Even if they don't in Kuwait, it, it's like, yeah. oh, I had to see what that nun's hair looked like. So I ripped her habit off. People would have been outraged <laughs> if he said that. Ugh. Um, traditional Kuwaiti women, when running errands, are normally seen wearing their traditional costumes, black abayas with their whole body covered from head to toe. Some Kuwaiti women also prefer to cover their face and hands too. And he talks like he only saw the eyes of this girl, but knew that there was some connection. And he saw her at the market every day for two years. Come on, I think you're bullshitting us, George. Just saying. Uh, But then later in a weird moment, when Mrs. Garrett does come in and is kind of like, oh, why isn't this more done? And how are we going? At one point she leans into him and they're like leaning on the counter. Their faces are inches apart where she says, was she worth it? And Tootie is right between them doing that weird thing I've pointed out where she's upstage of them looking through them, kind of sort of to the camera, but why the fuck are you there? If you're not looking at the people, even though blocking wise, you get why you don't want the head bobbing back and forth like a fucking tennis match. It was just weird and uh, uncomfortably intimate between George and Mrs. Garrett. It's like, oh, is she trying to fuck him too? Jeez. Yeah. I mean, she's single. She's, she's not engaged anymore, apparently. I don't know, maybe... Maybe we had an Auntie Mame situation where Ted fell off the ski slope, like Beauregard, Jackson, Pickett, Burnside. <laughs> Maybe. But no sooner does Mrs. Garrett leave the room, the girls convince him to go to a ball game with them at Langley. And he does. So Mrs. Garrett comes back to an empty room. And then 
we come back to a different later time where they're working apparently late into the night. They're annoying Joe because Tootie won't put the fucking power drill down. I would have slapped her. She's enamored. Like, again, the right Tootie's enamored by a drill. Yeah. She's looking at it like, what is this crazy object that I've just been handed? You You've never seen it. You never touched a drill before. Really? And, and that shit is loud holding it that close to your face. There's no, no, no. The, the volume would completely obliterate the fascination. I believe Joe is trying to study, but the noise is uh, preventing her from concentrating. Mrs. Garrett comes out in her nightgown where she's like, you fuckers woke me up. Why are you working so late? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Comes down in her nightgown. Well, oh my goodness, George Clooney is here. <laughs> here I am in my <laughs> nightgown. Oh heavens! Oh, just oh. one one zip, and I could accidentally be naked. And yes, I always sleep with a full face of makeup and lipstick. Fuck you. <laughs> oh, it made me laugh. Like it is thinking that she's like, is that George? Which? Where's my sexiest nightgown? <laughs> Sexiest flannel. Uh, Yeah, no, you're totally right. Uh Um, But doesn't her hair look fantastic? Do you see what I was talking about? How it's the shorter length, but they still can arrange it to look like her updo. And it actually looks better than with the balloon knot. Uh, Which she was hoping to show George Clooney. (laughs) (laughs) And then this great moment, Mrs. Garrett, refers to the slow progress. Why isn't more getting done? And George says, well, there's some problem with some supplies and it won't be done till Friday. And she's like, Friday, that's three days after the finish time we were expecting. It's like, bitch, if you can get a contractor to finish your project of that size, only three days late, you should be unzipping those jeans and sucking his dick. I'm sorry. Well, I would have done that, you know. Yeah. Anyway, part of the interview process. <laughs> but it's like, oh my God. I... <laughs> Three days. Yeah. Three days. It's, I believe the rule of thumb is that anytime you're doing renovation or construction, plan on it taking twice as long as you originally plan and costing twice as much. Mm. I I think that is actually a rule of thumb. And my experience with uh, renovating my kitchen and closing in my carport into a garage, uh, I can absolutely confirm that. (laughs) In, In trying to defend him that the work isn't getting done, it's like, well, it's a supply thing that he can't control that and uh, somebody says well it's not like we've been up partying all night and then in comes a pizza guy and the pizza guy is like hey who ordered this and who's the guy that called and did the great ricky ricardo impression clooney's like it's me ah you should hear my jack nicholson Ah, it's been just fun in games a ricky ricardo impression in 1985 david thank you why not a Reagan impression? Well, uh, exactly. Like, so Mrs. Garrett decides to fire George Clooney. Mm-hmm. So my question for you, David, mm-hmm. is why did it have to be unanimous for them to hire him? But bitch can walk in in her nighty and be like, you're fired. <laughs> you are so right. Ding, ding, ding. Oh, but before he leaves, he has to do one more um, Islamophobic oh, we, joke. Oh, yeah, that's right. We have one more offensive thing. How does he set it up? What does he say? Um, I don't know, but he has to cover half of his face with his yeah. coat. Yes, I guess I think he says, I guess I'll say goodbye the way they do in Kuwait. Yeah. And he holds up his leather jacket just below his eyes. Again, like a like a burqa, like a woman's. I hope that's the right word I'm using. Good God. Um, yeah, that would yeah. be a burqa. Yeah. Sorry is is different. Yeah. And that's it. In some cultures in the Middle East, it's just women have to have their hair covered. Yeah. You see, I mean, you see that here. Women who are Islamic women in this country always go out with a, a kerchief or something on. I just wear mine when I want to look like Kim Novak in Vertigo, you know, with my sunglasses and get out the convertible. Who doesn't? <laughs> so when we come back from commercial, 
the girls do kind of do a, how could you fire George? But it was more of a, but he's like our friend. We enjoy hanging out with him sort of a thing. You're right. The better version of this script would have said, uh, whoa, <laughs> bitch. I'm out, Edna. <laughs> <laughs> if we're partners, yeah. And this is where Mrs. Garrett, she does l- not quite lay into them, but she does say, look, Every time I've tried to hurry things along, I was either ignored or poo-pooed. You girls are out there listening to his stories. And the girls do kind of admit they, well, yeah. And she's like, look, you're business women now. You can't just go inviting him to a baseball game when there's work to be done. And it would have been nice if Edna even dug in her heels a little deeper because she's a little bit on the defensive. When they say you fired him, she's like, well, well, he wasn't getting it done. And And I'm like, no, no. Bitch, you should have stood your ground and said, uh, yeah, I did just pull rank on you guys. And that wasn't unanimous because the problem is not just George. The problem is also you. You are distracting him. You're charmed by him. You want to listen to his stories and take him to ball games. We have work that needs to get done. And then Joe could have been there to back her up and say, yeah, and I never liked him, you know, with yeah. that penis and all. Well, and I find it hilarious that Joe goes, he's not responsible for the job. Again, of all people, and I get why they're what they're doing. I get they're trying to set up a, a will they, won't they? They mm-hmm. won't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but of all people, Joe is the one judging a book by its cover. Hey. Of all characters. Yeah, Joe you're is right. the one that's like, I don't even know him, but I, but like, she wasn't that her whole character arc that people saw her and judged their the book by the cover of seeing Joe. And You're right. So I felt like that should have been Blair's category. Blair should mm-hmm. have been the one like, um, mm, I don't know, you know, I don't know. It just, I well, yeah, because there is a, a somewhat a romantic, a possible romantic thing later between Blair and George, but they're setting it up now with the, uh, Joe and George. I felt yeah. like this this um this interaction between them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. We will get to that in a second. But we do have this. Mrs. Garrett does have a good line that I love here, where she says, Nobody said that business decisions are easy, but you are business women now, and you're going to have to learn to make them. And so they're kind of like, Yeah, well, oh, fuck. And I love that Tootie was like, he has, George had manners. George had warmth. And George had, sh- Tootie, you're a senior in high school. <laughs> They're having this whole conversation. You're business women now. This girl is in high school. <laughs> it's true. And uh, okay, let's stop here. Let's do it right now and reiterate what I had said last week, where the Edna's edibles uh, paradigm was murky at best as far as we work here, we live here, you feed us, we're expected for dinner, and we have to put in so many hours to pay off our room and board, but we also get a paycheck and, you know, and we share in the profits of our, is it our cheesecake uh, fire sale that they had to have where she had to move all the cheesecakes and she's handing them their their money from the, it's like, no, no, they work there. Why yeah. are they? What the fuck is this, Amway? But anyway. When I worked at Dairy Queen. The owner never handed me any kind of profit. It was uh, uh, yeah. literally just my paycheck. It, it's so true. And so now we're in this furtherly murkier realm of, okay, well, you're not going to work for me. She says, I want you to be my partners. And so it's like, so... Okay, I'm I'm Joe Polnicek. I'm 21 years old and a junior in college. And I'm going to invest my money in some type of a shop, a retail business establishment in Peekskill, New York. That I'm going to keep I mean, it, the idea that girls of this age, the likelihood that they are going to stay in the same town where they go to high school which is a boarding school away from the place where they actually are raised and grow up. It's like the likelihood of that is so small, though we know Blair does stick around. I just love that in 1985, we accepted it. (laughs) You're like, sure. Okay. Did we? 
Well, I did, but then I was. I remember thinking it was weird. I remember even back then thinking it's weird. This scene of the girls and Mrs. Garrett ends with somebody saying, well, who do we get to replace George? Cut to Zeke, the belly guy working in the store. And (laughs) he's got, I think, a couple of workers, also extras in the background helping out. And it's like, okay. And uh, I do want to pause and say, I think the set designer for how awful that painted backdrop is, I think that the progression of the work, like going from burnt to a crisp to in process with George and now here getting close to done, I think they do a really good job. Wasn't (sighs) Zeke the one who said that he couldn't start for six months? Yeah, I uh, believe he did, Matthew. But, you know, of course, they had extra money to throw at him. Yeah. Because, you know, the money was such a problem, you know, and Blair's like, well, you know, I I would go to my pile of money, but I came here by train last week and uh, I don't know when the trains run. If I driven my car, I could drive to the bank and get my money, but I really can't. (sighs) Now, they are still working on the name of the store. This does come up earlier and they're trying to come up with the name of the store. I love Natalie's. Uh, she says, let's call it Cheap Thrills. I think that's fun. I would. Yeah. I love the name of that. I think that would have been a great name, actually. I, I wasn't mad at that as much as I was mad at Underground Punk Junk and Erogenous Zone. <laughs> the, the Erogenous other... Zone? Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> and great Natalie timing where she says, let's just free associate and just say words. First word comes to you and someone goes up, then down under Mary death and Natalie goes the death store why didn't I think of that and just walks away ha <laughs> ha now while the work is being done Mrs. Garrett comes in another show Bible moment Matthew oh she finds her burnt Edna's edible sign and she says look what I found I had it in my window for years well I mean technically yeah two years which is plural but you're you're acting like you had the shop for 20 like this was a oh my god i found this sign you only had it for two years honey in in the scope of your life edna's edibles is just a tiny blip you probably were in the peace corps longer than you were at edna's edibles Mrs. Garrett does also start alluding to the fact that she maybe does have some regrets about firing George and maybe she should have given him another chance. And uh, Joe was like, no, you weren't wrong to fire him because we got Zeke. Hey, Zeke's here. What can we do for you? What do you need? And that's where Zeke says, I need a thousand dollars or I can't finish this. And they're like, well, well, we can't come up with a thousand dollars. And it's Tootie that suggests Natalie give up her plane ticket because remember, Tootie is the one acting like Natalie is slapping her in the face and shitting in her mouth. Was that was that was that disgust or was that some? No, that, I like it. I wanted to see where it was going. I was willing to follow that train. Yeah, and continuing harping on guilting Natalie over a three month fucking trip to Europe, which she is paying for with her own goddamn money that she herself earned. It's like, Tootie, Jesus. But But Natalie acquiesces. She gives up her plane ticket. So the whole story about Natalie not going to college because she's going to travel the world. She's going to give that up to run a fucking Spencer Gifts in peak skill. Yeah, exactly. It's like, what? Really? Um, but the thing is, she does say it's just a postponement. She says it's it's a there. But then we go to let's further complicate whatever this business model is, where Mrs. Garrett says, OK, I will take your plane ticket money, Natalie, but it comes out of my share of the profits. Uh, we, uh, hmm? Huh? Wouldn't it be, I don't know that much about business, but I'm like, if a group of people threw their money into a pot and said, let's open a business, wouldn't you do it by percentage? 
wouldn't you say, well, let's set up a thing where if you put in 40% of the total kitty and I put in 12% that as the store makes money, you get 40% of the money, I get 12% of the money until we recoup our initial investment. And then we can all be equal partners. Is that? Well, yeah. And I mean, and also like it's, I I looked at it as like a producing fee, like here's a thousand dollars. So the first thousand dollars that this business makes belongs to me to pay back for my ticket. And then after that, it's like recouping expenses. You know what I mean? Uh I don't know, David. It's math. We're actors. What are we thinking? We should, we should have quit while we were behind. So then the mail comes. Bills, bills, bills. George's paper. And Joe reacts in her own close-up sort of, you know, medium close-up shot. And then we dissolve to a coffee shop where George is sitting there eating all by himself because, you know, (sighs) couldn't get a date. What a fucking dog. Well, he's disrespectful to Arabic women. (laughs) Wonder why he can't get a date. Mm -hmm. So true. Um, So Joe shows up and now it's like, oh, this is what's going on. Joe and he are going to patch things up. And because Joe was so opposed to him, I'm with you. They're setting up a will they or won't they. He is flirty. He is playing it. And I'm just like, girl, to, you know, you can you can visit the Isle of Lesbos as much as you want later. This is an opportunity that you do not want to miss. All I kept thinking was, George, you are wasting all that charm. <laughs> <laughs> but Joe apologizes. She says, I think I did something to you. Uh, I indirectly got you fired. And here's the thing. You're fun. You're easygoing. And easygoing isn't going to get the shop off the ground. So I set myself up as the watchdog uh, because all the others have something going on. Mrs. Garrett's worrying about this. Natalie's worrying about that. Blair is uh, looking at your jeans because Blair did comment, well, he's wearing Jordash jeans. So how bad could he be? His jeans are Calvin. Calvin's. That's right. Yes. So she's like, well, he is wearing Calvin's. And uh, that so his response to Joe listing off these different things that the girls are focused on. He's like, Blair is looking at my jeans and it's like, oh, OK, well, OK. Wow. Weird. Um, but then Joe says, I didn't give you a fair shot. And he says, hey, I let myself get distracted. But, you know. It was easy. <clears throat> Did that sound sexy or creepy? Yes. OK, thank you. I love him so much. so then we come back to the store they're folding up the drop cloths work is clearly just about done and then uh the other names are thrown out there (laughs) including mrs garrett wants to be called the cozy corner of course she does perfectly in line with her character so before the last nail goes in nope this is a sitcom we have to make a presentation of this moment so each of them has a, a hit of the final nail. Um, there is a point that Blair uh, kind of shows some skills that she acquired when she was trying to help out earlier. And when she hits the nail, Joe's response is, what a man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Joe, first of all, says, I don't want to pound the nail. No shit, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> but after Blair hits it, she practically undoes her blouse and plays with her nipples and goes, what a man. (laughs) (sighs) And also the last thing they have to do is pound a nail. Isn't usually like painting the last thing you have to do. It's like, (sighs) I just really, the last thing, the last thing is this one nail in the middle of this table. Yeah. Okay. Again, my issue with the writing. So as Mrs. Garrett goes to take her final strike at the final nail, she says, well, this is it. Now we've got our store and what, what are we calling it? And they all sort of shrug. They're like, I don't know. And then Blair says, how about over our heads? And they're like, why over our heads? Well, it describes our situation. That's kind of what we've been looking for is something that feels like it fits. And they're like, yeah, but 
Blair, you're a fucking millionaire. You've never been over your head and you could have technically paid for any and all of this, you selfish bitch. Um, anyway, they all are like, hmm, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Over our heads, over our heads it is. And then George shows up and it's like, oh, we'll make up. And he's like, ah, oh, the place came out okay, it's great. Mrs. Garrett says, come back and visit any time. And she says, George, would you do us the honor? Would you hit the final nail? And he oh. goes, and <laughs> I know, George, I I'd like to ask you to hit the final nail here too, let me tell you. So when he does it, he hits it incorrectly, bends the nail. It's a total fuck up. And the final line, he looks at them and says, no wonder you fired me. <laughs> oh, George. <laughs> <laughs> Roll oh, credits. Mm. Um. It's funny, I for all of this, for all this talking we've been doing for the last 17 hours, I I didn't hate it. There are little tweaks I would make, but I'm like, the idea of bringing him in as the contractor and God knows they're going to need him, like, like the character of Eldon on Murphy Brown, the idea of making a regular character the contractor in the never-ending renovations <laughs> in your apartment. But... Um, oh, God. I thought as an introduction as an introduction to Clooney and setting up this possible Clooney Nancy McKeon thing. It's like, oh, OK. Um, yeah. That's going to come back later when Paul Provenza joins. I remember clearly Paul Provenza uh, at the youth center where Joe works in the later season. I think it's season nine where it's like. Paul Provenza is clearly supposed to be a, a setup for Joe. And then he ends up dating Blair and, and yeah. Sierra. Like they get serious, yeah. if I recall. But it's like, do, do the writers realize these two women are not interchangeable? <laughs> do they do they know that? that? Do they not realize that these two women are dating each other? <laughs> That's my question. Oh, bless. Well, on that note, we end another episode. David, it's so good. Yeah, no. Next we... time we meet, the, the store will be stocked, David. Yes, <laughs> I cannot wait. We still will not get that title card. They are still holding that shit back. We are not going to see Edna's Edibles until they choose to show it to us. So uh, how, do we, how do we end this? But... Uh, if I had a nickel for every time a man asked me, how do we end this? <laughs> Usually it's you leaving the money on the dresser. <laughs> but that's just my experience. Yep. But I will tell you from my experience, um, as we look forward to season seven, um, the show really should be called The Facts of Life and George Clooney's Bulge. So oh. he's, God bless it, Diana Eden. Mm -hmm. that's true that's true mm -hmm. so matthew next week we're going to be back with episode three grand opening oh i can't wait to see mrs garrett's grand opening is that an allusion to her balloon knot oh i would like to see george clooney's grand opening then. <laughs> i'm sorry yeah that's uh that's a balloon knot i would not mind uh untying tying or okay that doesn't really work i does wouldn't it? even mind if the balloon knot came loose and it blew air in my face David. <laughs> 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 um. and there you have it now on the show i did say that little house on the prairie ran 10 or 11 or 12 years uh none of them was correct Nope. <laughs> Corrections Corner, Little House on the Prairie ran for nine years, just like the facts of life. Ran from 1974 to 1983, and then there were three TV movies that uh, brought it into 1984, but that was the end of it. So uh, just want to let you know, I am aware I screwed that up as I screw up so many other things. 
Next week, Matthew and I are going to be watching Season 7, Episode 3, Grand Opening. You can watch the show ahead of time for free at dailymotion.com. I will post the link in the show notes and in this episode's webpage. That is all for now. Thanks so much for listening to this week's show. And remember, the facts of life are all about you. Let's Face the Facts was created, produced, written, hosted, and edited by the wonderful David Almeida. Our theme song was beautifully arranged and recorded by Ned Wilkinson. Please visit facethefactspod.com for supplemental photos and videos, audio extras, links to social media, and ways that you can support the show. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. This is Matthew Arder saying tune in again next week for another thrilling episode of Let's Face the Facts.